This week on Africa Weekly, we take a look at the high-tech strides made this year in the fight against elephant and rhino poaching. We'll meet the young boys who dream of being star footballers for FC Barcelona as the club opens a training centre in Lagos. And we're off to Madagascar, where 7,000 tonnes of cocoa are produced every year, but underpaid farmers are calling for a sweeter deal. But first, a summary of the stories that made the headlines this week. At least 19 people have died in clashes in the Democratic Republic of Congo as protests erupted over President Joseph Kabila's mandate. Tension had been mounting for months ahead of the December 20 deadline for Kabila's second and final term in office to end. With no sign of him stepping down, opposition leader Etienne Tshisekedi called for peaceful resistance against Kabila's regime. His statement, which was not broadcast on local television, triggered protests among Congolese groups abroad. Congo's constitution means Kabila can't seek a third term, but a controversial court order allows him to stay on until a successor is chosen. Zimbabwe's President Robert Mugabe has secured his party's support to run in the 2018 elections. The 92-year-old has run the country for 36 years and once joked he would rule until he reached 100. But his ZANU-PF party has seen infighting sparked by the absence of a clear successor. In his acceptance speech, Mugabe called for unity and discipline. Ivorians have been voting this week in parliamentary elections, which saw President Alassane Ouattara's coalition win an absolute majority. It means that the president now has the parliamentary support he needs to clinch a second term. Voter turnout was low, but elections were praised as peaceful, despite concerns over incidents in the months before the vote. Ethiopia's president, Haile Mariam Dessalane, has inaugurated a hydroelectric dam that aims to double the country's electricity output. The 243-metre dam is the third biggest in Africa and is expected to produce enough power to cover domestic needs and to sell on to neighbouring countries for profit. But environmentalists and rights groups warn the project will dramatically decrease water levels downstream, affecting thousands of people who make their living in those areas. The World Health Organization has warned that non-communicable diseases are the new threat in Africa. It says that urbanization and bad habits are increasing the risk of heart disease, cancer and diabetes due to smoking, alcohol and poor diet. The WHO is calling on governments to put more money into treatments for these illnesses and to reorganize their health systems. As 2016 draws to an end, Africa's elephants and rhinos are counting the cost of a poaching crisis that has killed tens of thousands of animals. Rangers and park owners are turning to increasingly high-tech methods to try and ward off the poachers. 105 tonnes of ivory up in smoke. This was the scene in Nairobi in April this year when Kenyan authorities destroyed 16,000 elephant tusks. To lose our elephants would be to lose a key part of the heritage that we hold in trust. Quite simply, we will not allow it. We will not be the Africans who stood by as we lost our elephant population. Faced with an upsurge in elephants and rhino poaching, wildlife rangers across Africa are arming up. Canine patrols, high-tech equipment, drones, thermal cameras and automatic weapons. The fight against poaching is more and more like a war, which the continent says it can't win alone. If the world wants to see species such as rhinos and elephants continue to persist in the wild, then the world would also have to help. Um, I think it's unfair just to leave it to African countries and expect African countries to take care of that problem. This is an international issue. According to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the African elephant's population has dropped by over 100,000 in the last 10 years. There are just 415,000 African elephants left, and around 30,000 are killed each year. Rhinos are even more vulnerable, with their horns sold for more than gold or cocaine due to demand in Asia. Around a quarter of the world's rhino population has been killed in South Africa alone in the last eight years. We have to keep this issue high on the agendas of governments. We've got to keep the public awareness efforts going strong. And ultimately, we have to reduce the demand for the product by the consumers who are buying these, these species. 
the illegal wildlife trade is worth about $20 billion a year, making it the fourth biggest illicit trade after guns, drugs and human trafficking. But while some African countries prioritise the fight against poaching, others believe there are more important problems like conflict, poverty and hunger. Some of the world's finest chocolate will be made from these cocoa pods. In Ambanja, in the north of Madagascar, cocoa trees like the Criollo are protected from diseases and mold thanks to the geography and climate of the island. Cyril is very proud of his organic certified hectar. He also grows coffee and vanilla, but cocoa is his prize crop. Cocoa is very profitable, more so than vanilla, because cocoa grows all year round. Life in Ambanja would be very difficult if it wasn't for cocoa. After the harvest, the seeds are collected and sold to big companies via local cooperatives, which turn them into beans through a process of fermentation and drying. The luxury chocolate made in Europe from this cocoa will sell for close to 50 euros a kilo. But Cyril gets just 70 cents per kilo of seeds. We're still exploited by the whites, and we're aware of our fate. The price that collectors pay now, it's not the true price. It's not the right price. The price should be tripled, then it would be the right price. Most of the region's inhabitants work in the fine cocoa business, but they don't have the means to start making chocolate themselves. Even large producers such as Maver export the bulk of their harvest to foreign companies. And even fine cocoa doesn't escape the pressure exerted by these companies on the global cocoa market. La grande partie du chocolat most of the chocolate is made out of cocoa that's not fine cocoa. And the companies selling it are big companies such as Lint, Kraft, Sucha, Mars. They do chocolate bars, sweets. And they try to bring down the cocoa prices, which are set by the stock exchange. A small proportion of Maver's production is transformed into chocolate locally, which is sold in the capital and abroad. But with 90% of the country's population living beneath the poverty line, few Madagascans can get a taste of the final product. It's the first Barcelona FC training academy in sub-Saharan Africa. These would-be footballers are the first to try out the club's new pitch in Lagos in Nigeria. Based on the standards of the Catalonian club, the academy will take in 400 players in its first season. Given the country's limited number of football training centres, Barcelona FC hopes to boost the level of the game with its new venture. This is going to be a revolution for Nigerian players and Nigerian football. And the local league is also going to benefit from it because we have coaches that were trained and also those coaches are going to go out into the market. And then we also have kids that are going to play in the local leagues here too, and also across West Africa. With 20 million people living in Lagos, it could become the training ground of the next Lionel Messi. Benabia, who'll be supervising training, is aiming to change the way the sport's practiced. The way of training, the way of understanding the football is very different, but we want to introduce our way of think and our way of training. For young people, the new school brings fresh hope for success. While the Premier League may be more popular than the Spanish counterpart, the trainee footballers are more than happy to welcome the Catalonian club. I support Arsenal, yeah, but everyone has to start from somewhere. You can't get to choose the teams you want to play for at such a young age. So you just have to take what you get. It makes we happy because it makes other footballers to know that yes, we have Nigerians have talent and we can do better than some other people over there. But Barcelona isn't the only club with its eye on Nigeria. Paris Saint-Germain has signed several commercial agreements with local brands to promote the club and perhaps to recruit the footballing stars of the future. Next week will be in Madagascar, where protesters are making a mountain out of a gold mine. See you next week.